Okay, good morning. Thank you, Anita, Success and Lubega for joining class this morning. Um, before we begin, can I ask Success to lead us in prayer, please? All right. Thank you, Ma. Shall we pray? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Success. You can go ahead. Let us pray. The most precious Father, we want to say thank you. The ancient of this, I want to say thank you. Thank you for how far you have taken us in this course. Thank you, Lord, because none of us have missed it. Thank you because we are all alive. Thank you, Lord, for the knowledge. Thank you for the impartation of your word. Thank you for our lecturer. Father, we will re receive all the glory in the name of Jesus. My Father, my God, we commit this lecture into your hands today. Lord, please impart us in the name of Jesus. Father, we want to be the dweller and the hearer of your word this morning. Open our understanding in the name of Jesus. And enlighten us through your servant this morning, our lecturer in the name of Jesus Christ. At the end of the day, we will give you all the glory and all the glory will be returned unto you. Thank you, Lord, because we decrease that you may increase in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, success. Um, so on Wednesday, we were looking at uh, the doctrine of the church and uh, we were looking at uh, the local church as a family unit uh, and we also saw the local church as an army and uh, we said that uh, you know um, the local church as, a, uh, as an army uh, we have been given uh, spiritual weapons uh, that we as believers can uh, use uh, and we also discussed why is the local church called as uh, the army. We looked at uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 15 to uh, 19, uh, where it says, you know, God has given us the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we can bind on earth what is bound in heaven. We can lose on earth what is loosed in heaven. And uh, so we saw that Jesus is uh, describing the church as a body that is authorized by heaven to bind and loose uh, and to go against the powers of uh, darkness. And we also said that uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, you know, uses a lot of military imagery in his epistles, uh, which depicts that uh, or depicts that we as believers are engaged in spiritual conflict. Um, and uh, he talks about the spiritual armor uh, uh, in Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, you know, it, uh, the word of God also uh, admonishes us, uh, teaches us, uh, uh, exhorts us to uh, engage in uh, spiritual warfare and, uh, you know, uh, to be trained. Uh, we need to be taught and we need to be trained how to engage in um, spiritual warfare. And so we uh, look at some of the spiritual weapons that we have. Uh, what are the weapons, spiritual weapons that we have? I named eight of them. Do you all remember? What are the spiritual weapons that God has given us uh, to fight against our enemy? Thank you, Anita, the name of Jesus. Yes. What else? Seven more to go. The blood of Jesus. Thank you. Five more to go. What about the others? You all remember? What are the spiritual weapons that we have? Thank you, the word of God. Yes. So we have the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the word of God. What else do we have? Apart from reading the word, what else do you all do every day?
Yes, prayer. Thank you. Uh, praying in the spirit. Yes. Okay. That is prayer itself. Okay. When we go to church, uh, other than hearing God's word and praying, what else do we do in church? Worship. Yes, praise and worship. Do you remember anything more? Okay, thank you, Anita and Zilatoli. So we have the name of Jesus, we have the word of God, uh, the blood of Jesus, our position in Christ, uh, who we are in Christ. We have the full armor of God uh, that is uh, elaborated for us in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, then we have prayer and intercession, we have praise and worship, and we have uh, repentance and uh, righteousness, okay, repenting of our sins and righteousness. So we need to be trained uh, in all of this and how we need to use them. Okay, so since we are an army that is engaged in spiritual conflict, uh, there are some strategies, insights we can gain from how an army operates, and then we can relate that back uh, to how the local church as an army of God, as a body of Christ, uh, should function. So we look at the army, uh, you know, we have in uh, the earthly realm, uh, how it functions and uh, 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 you know, we can apply that back to how the local church body should function. So in the army, there is a rank, there is order, and there is discipline. Okay, these three things are uh, uh, very prevalent uh, or can be seen or topmost priority in an uh, army that is rank, order, and uh, discipline. And so how do we apply that back to the local church? Uh, we see that uh, in the local church, God has set leaders uh, amongst the local church body uh, to lead the local church. So it's their responsibility to be overseers, to be shepherds of the flock that God has given them. Uh, so we need to recognize and order, uh, honor leaders at all levels. Uh, but uh, however, we look at in scripture, we see that our obedience is first and, uh, you know, topmost uh, priority in our obedience first is to uh, God himself, okay? Uh, that is what we, uh, we learn from scripture, that, you know, our obedience is to God himself first and then to man. Uh, so we, it, this means that our absolute obedience is reserved only to God himself uh, because it's possible for human leaders to make mistakes, uh, uh, as we are uh, to submit to leadership that God has uh, placed in our family, in, the, uh, in our society, in our nation, in the church as well. We need to submit to authority. We need to honor them. Uh, we need to recognize them. But at the same time, you know, uh, when leaders tell us to do that something, the leaders tell us to do things that are against God's standard, his uh, will, his plan and his purpose, um, uh, his commandments, what he has given to us, then at that time, uh, you know, we have to do what uh, God has asked us to do and not obey our earthly leaders in those situations. So it's important that our priority first is our obedience to God uh, himself, uh, always in all situations, uh, but at the same time, uh, we also need to recognize the leadership authority that God has placed in our lives in, in over, uh, over every uh, sphere of our life, whether it's the uh, job place where we are working uh, or in the church or at home, uh, in the family uh, or uh, in the society that we are living in, uh, in the city that we are living in. We have leadership authority that God has placed. We need to recognize them, honor them. But at the same time, um, and obey them, but at the same time, our obedience comes of uh, our obedience is to God Himself first. So, uh, when uh, our leaders go against God's standard, His righteousness, His laws, His commands, at that time we choose to do what God has asked us to do in His Word. Okay, so that is about rank. Uh, we also need to have uh, a military mindset. Uh, which means, um, you know, people in the army are always on a high alert. Uh, 
uh, and also as uh, as uh, children of God, uh, we are constantly engaged in the spiritual battle because we're fighting against a spiritual enemy who is real and he is always there to um, attack us like it says in first peter chapter 5 uh, verse 8 and 9 it says be sober but be vigilant because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour resist him Step us in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So we need to always be on a high alert, uh, knowing that we are in battle. Uh, we need to always put on our uh, spiritual armor. Uh, we need to know how to use it, uh, when to use what. Um, uh, be very conscious, be very alert, uh, because our... Um, our enemy, uh, the devil, is like a roaring lion. He's looking for whom he may devour. Okay, and we know that uh, his plan for us is to steal, kill, and destroy us. So we need to resist him. Uh, and we need to be steadfast in the faith. Uh, and we need to um, use the spiritual armor that God has given us uh, to fight against him. So we need to be on high alert because we are in a battle. Uh, and we refuse to give the enemy any inroads uh, through any uh, uh, means that we have uh, sinned. Uh, we don't give the enemy any ground. So if we have done something that is wrong, we quickly ask God for forgiveness and we shut the doors uh, and we don't uh, give um, uh, Satan any access because we know that he we give him a a foothold, you know, he can just walk right in and destroy our lives. So we take, uh, that is why we said one of the uh, spiritual weapons that we have is repentance, okay, and righteousness. So we need to quickly repent of our sins um, and, uh, you know, get right with God, uh, even in the area of uh, unforgiveness, you know. Unforgiveness is also a... Uh, 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 a small opening in the door that we can allow um, the evil one to come in. So it, I know it's difficult for all of us to forgive people who have hurt us, uh, but we just uh, place it in God's hand, ask him to help us, give us the grace to uh, help forgive the person who has hurt us uh, and, you know, do what God uh, wants us to do. So we need to have that military mindset where, where we are always on the high alert. And uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27 says, do not give place to the evil one. Do not give place to the devil. Okay. So we need to uh, honor and recognize, uh, uh, you know, as an army, uh, you know, they, uh, they uh, honor the commanding officer. They do what the commanding officer says in total obedience. Uh, they have a military mindset, uh, which is they are always on a high alert, anytime ready for battle. The same way the local church uh, has to honor and recognize leadership, has to be uh, having a military mindset. And the third thing is have a military lifestyle. We as a local church who are engaged in a spiritual battle need to have a military lifestyle uh, just like, um, uh, you know, an army in the world uh, has. Uh, we saw the three things that in an army is that they have the rank, order and discipline. Um, uh, we know that in the army there is uh, high discipline that is followed. Uh, so also as uh, members of the local church who are engaged in spiritual battle, uh, we need to have a military lifestyle. And that is what uh, uh, Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, where he's uh, telling him that, you you know, you have to be like a, like a soldier and like a, uh, like a farmer and uh, like an athlete. Uh, you know, and like an athlete, you have perseverance and like a farmer, uh, you work hard and look forward for the fruit. And then he says, as a soldier, he says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Can one of you please read that? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, please. You hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Thank you, uh, John. So here we see that, you know, as a soldier, 
uh, Paul is exhorting um, Timothy to endure hardship because it's uh, hard work, it's hard labor, it's hard, um, uh, uh, you know, you have to go through a lot of hard training uh, and also, you know, uh, a set lifestyle. Uh, so he says, endure hardship as a good soldier. Uh, and also, he, uh, a soldier is always ready for the call of duty. Uh, you know, he may take care of his family, but he's not so caught up in that, that he cannot respond to the call of duty. Uh, anytime when there is a call of duty, it is his duty first, then his family. Uh, so we see that no man who's a soldier gets entangled with the affairs of this life. Um, and as, uh, uh, as people who are part of uh, God's army, uh, the church, you know, we also need to live that way. Uh, we need to be always ready to do what God calls us to do, which does not mean that we overlook our family or we don't take care of their needs. We have to. But our first priority is uh, what God has called us to do. Okay. And uh, so that is what uh, uh, it means about a military lifestyle, just like a soldier is not caught up in his, uh, uh, you know, uh, entangled with the affairs of this life. So also we shouldn't uh, get too entangled with the affairs of this life, but uh, they are always ready for the call of duty in the same way. Uh, similarly, we need to also be ready for God's, uh, ready to do God's call uh, any moment he asks us to. So we live as soldiers. Uh, while we discharge our earthly duties, uh, we must keep ourselves from being entangled with the affairs of this um, life and that is what uh, it means to have a military lifestyle so we looked at three components uh, in in an army in an earthly army and uh, we saw how that can be uh, applied uh, back to uh, or how it can operate in uh, the local church uh, who, which is an army of god okay so any questions so far about the church as a body the church is a family and the church is a army of God, the local church. Any questions? Okay, no questions. So we'll move on to the sacraments of the church. So far, we looked at, uh, we had uh, in the lesson, the doctrine of uh, the church. So far, we looked at the definition of the church, ecclesia, uh, which the church means uh, simply a gathering of those who have been called out for a definite purpose. Uh, we looked at each uh, word and each phrase in detail. Uh, then we looked at the important truths about the church, which is the body of Christ. And we also looked at the impo important truths concerning the local church. Uh, we looked at the mission of the local church. And then we looked at how the local church is a body, is a family, and is uh, an army. Now we look at the sacraments uh, of the church. Uh, what, the, what does the word sacrament mean? Sacraments, or what is the other word for sacraments? Ordinances of the church, okay. What is uh, the meaning of ordinance, or sacraments, ordinance? Rituals, okay. Ordinances basically mean decrees or rule uh, uh, that, you know, we follow. Uh, so what are the two sacraments of the church that the church follows? What are the two sacraments that the church follows? Thank you, Lubega, baptism, and thank you, Subhashish. Uh, it's the Lord's Supper. Yes, thank you. Um, 
Yes, the Holy Communion. Thank you. Uh, so by sacraments or ordinances of the church, we basically refer to the practices uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, himself ordained, uh, you know, to be permanently observed by the church. So something that is an ongoing thing, uh, which Christ himself has ordained, uh, which we need to uh, follow regularly. Uh, so we see that water baptism and the Lord's Supper um, uh, are, or the Holy Communion are two sacraments ordin uh, ordained by Jesus Christ himself uh, for the church. Okay, So these ordinances are practiced by the believers um, and it's a means by which we can experience the power of Christ, uh, basically the finished work of the cross, uh, which becomes real and effective in a believer's life. So through these two sacraments or these two ordinances, uh, uh, which we do regularly, which is like a ritual, but it is more uh, significant. Uh, it has more meaning uh, by which, you know, we experience uh, uh, the, the full completed, uh, uh, you know, work, uh, finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, uh, which becomes very real and effective in our believers' uh, life. So we must desire uh, to take part in the sacraments and also uh, learn how to receive the power of God into our lives uh, as we pa uh, participate in the sacraments of the church. So we look at the first sacrament that is uh, water baptism. Um, now who introduced the water baptism in scripture? John the Baptist. Thank you, Lubega. So yes, it was introduced by John the Baptist. Uh, in We read this in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, uh, when he was announcing uh, the kingdom of heaven on earth as a sign of repentance. Uh, and so we read uh, there that repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, then all the people who are in Jerusalem and Judea and the region surrounding uh, the Jordan went to John the Baptist and were baptized uh, by him in the river Jordan, uh, confessing their sins. So those who repented of their sins is a sign of repentance. Uh, they were uh, baptized. And yes, it is not something that he did it on his own. It was uh, a command that he received from God the uh, Father. Okay, so was uh, basically uh, baptism. Uh, what is baptism basically? What is your understanding of baptism? Or who takes water baptism? Yes, Lubega. I think number one, a person who has to take baptism must be an adult of sound mind. Number two, he must have acknowledged that it, he is a sinner and Jesus Christ died for his sins and is. Uh, I think those are basically the two things that uh, he must have. Uh, he or she must acknowledge and he must be of age. That's very important. And it should be also full emancipation. I mean, immersing of a human being into uh, water which is not station, water which is at movement, maybe in a river, maybe in a, a lake, or even if it's in a pool, but water which is not station. Thank you, Pastor. So you're saying that water so that is not uh, stationary, that is moving like a river? I think, yeah, a river correct, a lake correct, and uh, in a pool, which is also occasionally changed, is correct. And uh, maybe technology has bought other things, but I don't believe this one of the Benson sprinkling of water into somebody's forehead. I don't accept that. You don't accept what? You Sorry, don't accept I couldn't what? Hear. Sorry, I couldn't hear. This is sprinkling of water into somebody's forehead, a baby, such a thing. I disagree with that. 
yeah, sprinkling of water is not it is uh, immersion in water. That is what we see biblically uh, mentioned to us. And that is water baptism. Yes, it takes place uh, in a water body where the person is immersed in water and it's not just sprinkling of uh, the water on the, uh, on the forehead, on the head of uh, a child. Yes. Uh, so it's basically repentance of sin, uh, sins, the one who's repented of their sins. But she says the one who believes in Jesus, uh, one who believes in Jesus. Uh, there are many people who believe in Jesus. So would you like to qualify that? Yes, the one who uh, 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 believes in Jesus and repents of their sins, uh, confess their sin and thank you and accept him as uh, their savior. Yes, that's very important. Uh, so one who believes in what Jesus did on the cross, uh, that he's uh, God, that he died on the cross for their sins, uh, repent of their sins, uh, ask for forgiveness and accept Jesus as their personal uh, savior. Yes, so they uh, are the ones who take uh, water baptism. And so here also we see that those who repented of their sins uh, were baptized by uh, John the Baptist in the river Jordan. Uh, now, was Jesus baptized? Yes, Nubega, that's right. Also accept him as the only begotten son of God. Yes, as, as I said, that they should accept and believe that he is God who came down as man and died on the cross for their sins. Okay, thank you. Yes, Jesus was baptized. Now, why did Jesus have to be baptized? We know that only those who repent of their sins, uh, you know, as an act or sign or symbolically, uh, you know, uh, they do it uh, as an act of repentance, that they have repented of their sins. Okay. Uh, Jesus did it to fulfill all righteousness, as he has mentioned. Yes, as he mentioned in uh, Matthew chapter 3. Okay. As an act of obedience. Yes, thank you. So was uh, Jesus sinful that he had to uh, repent of his sins and so be baptized? What's your answer? Yes, no. Okay. A pregnant? No, no. Okay. Okay, yes, uh, Jesus was uh, a sinless. Um, and uh, he, we know that, uh, you know, uh, uh, but why did he have to be baptized? Like you said, it's an act of obedience and also to fulfill all uh, righteousness. Um, Okay, so after John the Baptist began his ministry uh, announcing uh, the baptism of repentance, uh, it is very interesting uh, to see there, uh, uh, to note that the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God, who became man himself, came to John the Baptist, uh, bap John the Baptist to be baptized in water. Um, and we know that uh, the Lord Jesus had no sin to repent of. He was sinless. He was perfect. Um, he lived every moment in perfect obedience to the Father. Uh, he was the one, uh, the Lamb of God, who was to take away the sins of the whole world. Uh, but yet we see Jesus getting baptized in water. And why does he do it? Do that? There are two reasons uh, given in Scripture why Jesus was baptized in water. Um, the first thing was, um, you know, uh, remember that uh, John the Baptist was to uh, point out who the Messiah was or who the Savior of the world was. Okay, uh, We know that uh, the entire Jewish race were looking for uh, the Messiah. Why were they looking for the me Messiah? More than ever, they were anticipating the coming of the Messiah. Why? More than any other point in history, they were uh, desperately anticipating or looking forward for the coming of the Messiah. Why?
Yes, thank you, Zilatoli. They were under the Roman rule and they were severely, uh, you know, persecuted. Uh, they were, uh, you know, uh, they were treated very badly. They had uh, uh, no rights, no authority. They were, uh, and they had no, um, uh, you know, a nation of their own. Uh, they were utterly frustrated uh, with the Roman rule, with the, everything that was so, uh, you know, politically wrong, uh, economically wrong, socially wrong. Uh, there was so much of injustice there. Uh, that was prevalent and also for the way that uh, the Christians, the believers were persecuted, were treated. Um, and hence, you know, they were looking forward for uh, the Messiah to uh, come. And, uh, you know, John the Baptist uh, was the one who God chose, God the Father, to point out uh, who the Messiah was, who the Savior of the world was to the people because they were looking forward, they were anticipating the coming of the Messiah. And in addition to the Messiah coming to him and being baptized in the water, uh, John the Baptist was told by God that, you know, the spirit would descend and remain on him. And that would be a sign that this is the Messiah. So it was not just the Messiah coming to him uh, to be baptized, but the Holy Spirit will come and descend uh, and remain on him and remain on the Messiah. And that is a sign uh, how John the Baptist will know that this person is the Messiah who's chosen by uh, God. So this is the first reason why Jesus was baptized in the water, uh, because God the Father had given this as a sign to John uh, so that uh, John could point out and, annoy, uh, and announce that Jesus is the son of God. Um, and we also see that Jesus requested uh, John the Bapt uh, Baptist to baptize him. Uh, and he says that so they could fulfill all righteousness, like uh, some of you had mentioned uh, in the, uh, your answers. Yes, it was uh, Jesus came to John the Baptist uh, to baptize him so that he could fulfill all uh, righteousness. And uh, which means that, uh, you know, he wanted to do everything that was right in the eyes of the father, uh, do all that the father wanted done at that uh, moment. Okay. Uh, so there is something about water baptism uh, uh, that is uh, bigger or that was bigger than the, the sign of repentance from uh, sin. And uh, what is that? It is something that even the sinless Son of God, the Lamb of God, desired to step into. Uh, it is an expression of the will of God uh, to be released on the earth. So another way of looking at, uh, you know, to fulfill all uh, righteousness, uh, you know, uh, that we can look at uh, ba water baptism as something that is even bigger than uh, repentance from sin. Uh, and it was something even uh, Jesus, you know, stepped into as the Lamb of God, because it was an expression of the will of God uh, uh, being released here on earth. Okay, so everyone uh, who says yes uh, to the will of God to be saved, uh, to receive salvation, to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, accept him as a son of God. Uh, uh, everyone who says yes to the will of God, the kingdom of God to be released here on earth, would step into water baptism as an expression of their yes to God. So a yes to God is not just a sign of repentance from our sins, saying yes to salvation, saying yes to what Jesus has done on the cross, but it's also a yes to the, um, to the will of God to be released here on earth, uh, which means uh, a yes to the kingdom of God being released here on earth. Okay, so that is uh, 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 why Jesus himself, uh, you know, stepped into water baptism because he was uh, saying yes to doing the will of God. He was also saying yes for the kingdom of God the kingdom of heaven to be ushered here on earth, which is he, go, he is going to bring in here, usher it here on earth. And um, so all of us who say yes to water baptism are also saying yes to 
salvation, yes to the will of God, and yes to uh, the kingdom of God being released uh, here on earth in and through our lives, in and through our, uh, our ministry, in and through our family, in and through, uh, you know, whatever secular work we do, okay? Uh, the third thing is that baptism is a command in the New Testament. Uh, we read this in Matthew chapter 28, uh, 19 and 20, which is the Great uh, Commission. Uh, Jesus said, uh, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when we baptize anyone, we baptize them in the name of the Father, uh, in the name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And uh, it says also in the Great Commission that we teach them to observe all things uh, that God has commanded uh, us to. Okay? And baptism is an expression of uh, one's decision uh, to follow Jesus Christ alone. Uh, we read this in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39. Uh, can one of you please read Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39, please? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Thank you, John. So here we see uh, Peter preaching this message after uh, just when the disciples were 120 in the upper room, were all baptized with the Holy Spirit. And uh, we know that 3,000 of them repented, and then he asked them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And this is their expression to follow Jesus Christ alone. The fifth thing is that baptism is a symbol of our inner experience uh, of uh, uh, it's a symbol of the inner experience of death, burial, and resurrection with um, uh, with Jesus Christ. So, what Jesus Christ went through, his death, burial, and resurrection, it is a symbol that we also experience when we are bap water baptized. So, uh, you know, when we go underwater, it's like we are dead to our sins. Uh, we are cleansed of our sins because water cleanses us, purifies us, washes us. We are immersed, we are buried, and then we come out. It's like we are resurrected into newness, into new life. We are a new creature. Uh, we are born again uh, with the spirit, uh, in our spirit man with the, uh, the nature of uh, God himself. And so it's a symbol of the inner experience that we have of the death, burial, and resurrection uh, with Jesus Christ. And um, Paul writes this in uh, detail in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, where he says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of the life. So uh, when we come out of the water, it just signifies that, you know, we are uh, born again, uh, we are resurrected into the likeness, the image um, of God himself. We have the very nature of God in our spirit man, and we are here to manifest his glory, uh, the glory of the one and only uh, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Okay. The sixth one is that baptism is an expression of our desire to maintain a clear conscience um, before God, okay? Um, uh, so uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Can one of you please read that? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. First Peter chapter 3, verse 21. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities and powers in submission to him. Thank you. So here we see that, uh, you know, the water that symbolizes baptism is, uh, you know, is something that pledges or brings about a clear conscience towards 
God. Uh, no, we, uh, we know that, you know, when we were living in sin, in our old man, our conscience is so dead to the things of God. And that's why we can repeat it. We repeatedly kept on sinning because our conscience is so smeared. It's so, so dead to the things of God. But uh, once we are born again, you know, our conscience is revived uh, towards God, towards the things of God, towards sin. And that's why uh, when we do something, you know, our conscience immediately pricks us and we know that we have sinned and we know that we need to ask God for forgiveness and we know that it has hurt the very heart of uh, God. And we don't take pleasure in that. Uh, we don't take pleasure in the sin that we are living in because now we are born again. You know, it really pricks us, it really pokes us, and we do something to deal with that uh, sin. The seventh one is uh, the only requirement to be baptized is to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We read that in Acts chapter 8, verse uh, 36 and 37. Uh, where, uh, can one of you please read that? Acts chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. Sorry, I don't think uh, this is the verse. This is about, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, talking about the uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, repent and believe what we had just read in, uh, uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39, where Peter says, now that you have, uh, you know, repented of your sins, uh, you know, let everyone be baptized in the name of uh, Jesus Christ. So the only requirement to be baptized uh, is to repent and believe uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. No other criteria. Uh, you know, it's not that they have to uh, have known Christ for at least one year or three months or six months or attended uh, some classes or, uh, you know, if they are only, um, uh, we also at uh, APC, uh, we also baptize children, uh, you know, uh, who have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior. And if their uh, parents feel that, uh, you know, their, their child is sure about their salvation experience, uh, then we get them baptized. It's so that they could, uh, you know, experience uh, uh, the finished work, the full completed finished work of Jesus, uh, which he completed on the cross, they can experience it even from a very uh, young age. It can be operated from a very young age. And yes, of course, we have to nurture, uh, uh, just like we have to nurture somebody in an adult, uh, you know, uh, who we think is quite mature enough, but uh, we know that we've learned that, um, you know, uh, uh, people can be um, uh, very spiritual, but not necessarily mature in their understanding of things. We looked at it, uh, I think, when we were studying in systematic theology, you know, uh, maturity and sensitivity, sensitivity to the things of uh, God. Uh, so, you know, people can act mature, uh, spiritual, can be very spiritual, like uh, I said, uh, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, um, they were all flowing uh, mightily in all the nine gifts of the Spirit. Like I'd explained, everyone was eager when they came to church uh, to, you know, share what they have received as this word of wisdom, word of knowledge, prophecy, uh, speaking in tongues, interpreting of tongues. They were just so eager that they were not even waiting for each other. Uh, they were just speaking simultaneously. And so, you know, Paul is writing and saying, we need to have some order in the church. I know you are... Uh, all flowing mightily, all of you are so eager, you have a word, you know, word of prophecy, but says do it in perfect order. And then he also goes on to say that, you know, it's sad that um, uh, even though you all are flowing mightily in all the gifts, you are still uh, spiritual babes. 
you know, uh, who have to drink milk. Uh, and uh, so he admonishes them. So, you know, people who are adults who think are mature enough, uh, you know, uh, we can get them baptized, but we think children know, uh, but uh, the only criteria that... Uh, for a person to be baptized is for them to have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior, uh, you know, and so that they can experience the full benefits of what Jesus has done on the cross, uh, you know, from a very early age. And we don't see any other requirement uh, given uh, about water baptism anywhere uh, other than repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now we know that uh, baptism is by immersion in water only. Uh, we read this in Acts chapter 8, verse 36 and 37, when Philip met the uh, Ethiopian eunuch and uh, he sh explained to him what he was reading from Isaiah and went on to talk about Jesus, his death, and what he has done, his resurrection. And it says here in verse 36 and 37, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there is here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into water and Philip uh, baptized him. Okay. And uh, we also see that, uh, you know, when Jesus was baptized, he was fully immersed because he says when he came out of the water, uh, the Holy Spirit came on him and settled on him as a uh, dove. Okay. Uh, you don't have to be too holy to be baptized, uh, super spiritual, uh, and all of those things, you just have to repent of your sins and ask Jesus as your personal savior, uh, you can receive water baptism. And also water baptism, when you take water baptism, you will not be made a spiritual giant. You will automatically not be made a spiritual giant. But, uh, you know, uh, we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We need to, uh, you know... Um, uh, sanctify our, uh, uh, our uh, faculties, our, uh, our bodies every day consecrated to the Lord, uh, make choices that in a, uh, are in accordance to God's will, His ways. Uh, and we need to grow spiritually uh, through uh, reading God's word, meditating on God's word, and through prayer. Okay. We also see that water baptism is an act of obedience. Um, and once you do this, uh, as a sign of repentance, uh, saying yes to the will of God, yes to his kingdom, uh, being established uh, here on earth through your life, through your ministry, through your family, uh, you can experience the full measure of the blessings of the finished work of the cross that Jesus had completed on the cross. Okay. And uh, the twelfth one is because baptism is a symbolic proclamation of the cross, you can ex expect the power of the cross uh, uh, to affect your life in breaking bondages, strongholds, uh, bringing deliverance, uh, setting you free from every addictions uh, after you or uh, during baptism or when you are being baptized and after that as um, well. Okay. And we see in the book of Acts, when we read in the book of Acts, that each time people were baptized, they were baptized in the name of uh, Jesus. So we understand that uh, this means that, you know, Jesus has given us the authority. Uh, we've been given the authority by Jesus to baptize people, but we baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the formula we use in Jesus' name uh, uh, is I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, of, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so uh, we baptize in the name of Jesus. Uh, so we say in the name of Jesus, I baptize you. You know, you can mention the person's name in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the, that is a formula in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But uh, you're saying that I baptize you. It's not uh, me personally baptizing you, but it's I'm doing it because uh, I've been given the authority uh, in Jesus' name uh, to baptize you, so-and-so, whatever the person's name is. And then, you know, uh, we baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this is just briefly about uh, the baptism, uh, water baptism. Anyone has any questions?
So something new that we've learned is, you know, baptism is just not repentance of sin, but it's a symbolic proclamation of the cross where we can experience uh, everything Christ has finished on the cross and we can expect our bondages, addictions, uh, 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 you know, can experience healing and deliverance from everything. It's also doing it, uh, uh, saying yes to the will of God, saying yes to uh, his kingdom, uh, to be ushered here on earth, uh, even as we are baptized through our lives, through our ministry, through our family, through whatever secular job that we are doing. So anyone has any questions? I hope, Rubega, you got clarity that the first thing is not uh, the person is not to be an adult or mature, uh, but the first thing is that they need to repent and believe uh, that's the most important criteria that scripture gives us for water baptism. I don't know if you agree with that or disagree. No thoughts on that? Yes, Lubega. And I think that's also a point to take in. Thank you, teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there are no questions, uh, thank you all for joining class today. I'll uh, see you next Wednesday. Remember, we don't have our Christology class on Mondays because we've finished our portions. Uh, so we'll uh, meet next Wednesday for our next class on uh, doctrinal foundations where we look at the Lord's table. So happy Friday, all of you. Have a good day, a blessed day, and a blessed weekend. And I'll see you next uh, Wednesday. Thank you.